Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Robert Baylor, Director of Communications at NUCA. Welcome to this month's webinar. First, before we begin, some webinar housekeeping. Today's webinar will be recorded, and a copy of the recording will be provided to all registrants and attendees. It will also be made available in the next few days on NUCA's YouTube channel, which can be accessed via NUCA.com. Now about your WebEx Meetings webinar screen. There are two buttons on the lower right-hand side of your screen titled Participants and Chat. Clicking on Participants gives you a list of webinar attendees. You can chat amongst each other, or you can send the host questions or messages. All participants are muted upon entry. Phone participants can use star six to mute and unmute themselves. Questions will be saved and asked at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, you could submit a written question at any time using the chat feature, and I'll read those written questions to our presenter at the conclusion of his presentation. Now let's get started. This month's webinar will, will bring NUCA members up to speed on prevailing wage regulations. Last fall, NUCA helped secure about $200 billion in potential project resources from the core infrastructure bill signed into law by the president. A sizable portion of that will be for federally funded projects that may be subject to federal Davis-Bacon prevailing wage regulations. So what are these regulations and how can knowing the ins and outs of these regs benefit my company? If you're a NUCA member and considering or starting a prevailing wage project in the future, then this webinar is for you. Today's presenter is Mr. Jason Spearslock, Sales Director at NUCA Partner Benico. Jason is an expert in Davis-Bacon regulations, and he'll be discussing how you can streamline these federal requirements and even save some money through unique employee benefits, compliance services, and other HR solutions promulgated by these rules. Jason is a five-year veteran of Benico and is passionate about finding solutions to simplify complicated processes for clients while saving them money. Thanks so much for joining us today on NUCA's webinar webinar. NUCA's webinar Wednesday. <laughs> Jason, I turn the webinar over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> uh, big thanks to NUCA to having me today and everybody for joining us. Uh, I believe I recognize a few names on here from the uh, National Convention in San Antonio earlier this year. Uh, it was a great time as always. Um, so if I haven't had a chance to meet you in person yet, hopefully uh, one of the future events will be able to do so. Uh, but for today, we have our uh, presentation here prepared uh, online for a, for a webinar. So with that, we can kind of go ahead and get started. There we go. All right, for our, for our agenda today, uh, start off with just a little bit about who is Benico and what do we do? Uh, then we're gonna get into the Davis-Bacon Act and some prevailing wage regulations. Uh, we're going to how to save thousands of dollars in payroll taxes and insurance premiums on these projects. Uh, how to utilize fringe dollars to reduce the cost of employee benefits uh, and optimize your 401k plan with fringe dollars. And how to attract and retain key employees uh, by winning prevailing wage projects. Um, you know, it's a very competitive marketplace out there for uh, bringing on new employees and keeping the employees you have now. So uh, definitely want to kind of wrap up with, with that at the end of our presentation. And then, uh, like we said earlier, we'll, we'll definitely have time at the end for a Q&A. So who is Benico? Uh, Benico is a trusted name in contractor benefits. Um, we've been in business now actually for 35 years, uh, focusing almost exclusively on the prevailing wage market, uh, helping those contractors that do prevailing wage work at the state and federal level um, across the country in all 50 states. Um, over the last 10 years, we've had over $700 million in prevailing wage money contributed to our benefits programs, saving our clients over $125 million in labor costs. And, and that's kind of what we're going to get into and explain that process and how that can work for you. Um, by doing that, we've helped over 60,000 workers and their families uh, save for retirement and, and have quality employee benefits to support them. A little more history about Benico. Uh, we were acquired by a census about two years ago, and we fall under their future plan line of business. Uh, just a little information about a census. Uh, they are the largest independent record keeper of 401k plans in the country. And their future plan line of business where we fall into play is their uh, third party administration side of the business. And they're the largest conglomerate of third party administrators in the country on 401k plans as well. So they kind of acquired us to, to come in and be the prevailing wage expert for their, um, for their benefits programs uh, and, and benefits clients. Uh, so we still kind of have that specialty uh, in our kind of small business that was started 30 years ago with the backing of a much larger much larger company giving us additional resources uh, and ability to help more, uh, more contractors throughout the country. 
So along with Nuka, we partner with a lot of industry leaders. As you can see here, a few examples, uh, ABC, IEC, RPAG, and others. Uh, so we're trying to get out there and work with as many of the great um, associations and leaders in the industry uh, like Nuka. So a little bit about what uh, products and services does Venico all offer? Uh, we offer a full suite of employee benefits uh, and work as the record keeper and third party administrator for these benefits programs. And where we are unique is that all of these uh, benefits programs, uh, retirement, 401k, life insurance, health and ancillary uh, insurance benefits uh, are all tailored to, for the prevailing wage contractor. So there's different rules and regulations that we'll get into uh, when offering employee benefits for prevailing wage work prevailing wage employees, and we have all of our programs set up to meet those requirements uh, to maximize the savings for the company and also for, for the employees, for the participants in the plan. So Robert had touched on this a little bit already, um, but it's a very good timing for us to be having this conversation now. Uh, there's definitely been a lot of um, a lot of publicity in the last year on the infrastructure spending bill that was passed in November uh, in the increase uh, of what that's going to provide for construction jobs over the next several years, but specifically in the prevailing wage market. So what we're seeing is an increase. One is companies trying to get into the prevailing wage market that maybe have not in the past. Uh, they see it as a, a good place to grow their business in the future. And, you know, if there's a, a slowdown in private sector work, I know that's going to be made up for with what's going to be coming up from the infrastructure bill and, and public projects. So more companies are getting into the space. And even those that have been in there for a while are seeing increased competition for, for winning those jobs that are coming uh, due to kind of the, the buzz around these prevailing wage projects in the infrastructure bill. What is the Davis-Bacon Act? Uh, the Davis-Bacon Act is a federal law requiring contractors to pay at least the locally prevailing wages. Uh, now, this is also subject, this is subject to all federally funded projects, uh, as well as state and locally funded projects where applicable. We've right now, there's roughly 36 states that have prevailing wage laws themselves. Uh, so I know we have you know, people in the audience from all across the country, uh, so they might vary you know, slightly by state by state, what we're going to be discussing today, the concept of everything we're going over is going to be the same regardless of where you're located, um, but there are some nuanced differences. So if you have questions specific to your state, something that might be a little bit different, you know, feel free to ask us at the end, um, or we can follow up with that if you've got kind of a question based on your location specifically. Now, how it applies for states that have prevailing wage laws versus those that don't. Uh, I'm actually located in Arizona. I'm in the Phoenix area. And in Arizona, we do not have a state prevailing wage law. So in the state of Arizona, the only time that this comes into play is on federally funded uh, Davis-Bacon projects. Now, conversely, next door to us in California and the same in New Mexico, uh, they do have state prevailing wage laws often referred to as mini Davis-Bacon acts. And in those states, any, any construction projects that's funded by the state, city, county, any of the local municipalities fall under prevailing wage rules and regulations. Like I said, different states can have some minor different rules um, that you know we can definitely assist you with if you've got some specific questions. And again, these prevailing wages, they vary uh, based on geographic location and craft. So if you're doing work in multiple states, you're gonna see you know, different wages, different rates. And also if you have different classification of, of employees, different crafts that you're doing, those wages are gonna be different for them as well. So when do prevailing wage laws apply? Um, again, I've kind of covered this. Uh, it's federally funded construction projects in excess of $2,000 uh, in all of those states uh, that have many Davis-Bacon Acts that are funded at the state or local levels. Uh, the same laws apply for Service Contract Act contracts. Uh, if you ever come across those, they're oftentimes not in the construction space as much as the, they can fall under landscaping or security. Uh, I know if there's a security contract at a courthouse or something like that. Uh, you can see Service Contract Act. Um, so if you ever come across that, the same rules and regulations basically apply as the Davis-Bacon Act. But kind of when does this apply, not apply, and kind of who does it apply to as far as who needs to be paid these prevailing wage rates? So they are specific to the laborers and mechanics on qualified projects whose duties are manual or physical in nature. So it's just going to be those workers that are actually doing the, the, the physical labor work on these projects that need to be paid prevailing wage rates. 
And it's just the work that they do on the actual site of work. And that's defined in the Department of Labor prevailing wage resource book, but basically it's specific to the site of the project. So easy example is that if you have, you know, some of your employees that are doing you know, laborers or mechanics that may be um, maybe at your at your office or at, at you know, where you're located doing some work for a prevailing wage project, if they're not actually on the site of the project, they do not need to be paid prevailing wages. Uh, this also applies to owners and administrative employees. So admin employees do not need to be paid prevailing wages. You know, if they're working in the office doing bids for prevailing wage projects, um, submitting certified payroll, uh, there's no prevailing wage rates for those employees. It's just the laborers and mechanics that are actually on the job site. And then again, for owners, owners generally do not need to be paid prevailing wages. And this even applies uh, if they do go out in the field for a day. So the way it's defined is if an owner's uh, responsibilities are primarily managerial and administrative uh, in nature, they do not need to be paying prevailing wage rates. Um, easy examples if you know maybe you've got a few employees calling sick one day, the owner of the business you know goes out on the job site and works on the job for the day uh, due to having missing employees. You do not need to pay the owner of the business uh, prevailing wage rates for that day of work since they're primary responsibilities are administrative, managerial in nature. So wage determination, this is where we actually get the rates that need to be paid on these projects. And the wage determination is a regulation that establishes the prevailing wage rates and fringe benefits for work classes in geographic areas. Now you can go online and find these. I have the, um, for federal Davis-Bacon projects, the link on here, and it'll be on the presentation that we share. Then locally different states uh, have these posted on a, a state website, whether you know in California, it's on the DIR website there, or other states have it listed other places, but you can go online and, and find these wage determination sheets for your area. And, and again, make sure that you have the specific area of the project or what was included when you won the bid, um, because it can be, it'll vary county by county. Um, so small differences geographically can make differences in those rates. So how are the rates determined? Um, this can vary a little bit by state, but they're they're primarily determined by surveys that are sent out, and these tend to largely be influenced by uh, by union shops. So it's going to oftentimes reflect, you know, what the union rates are for base pay plus benefits. So if you ever get a survey that's sent out, you know, asking for you know the wages that you're paying in your area, I would definitely encourage to complete those, um, send them in because they are used to determine the prevailing wage rates, which is where we oftentimes hear you know people comment that. The, the wages they're seeing for prevailing wage projects is not what they would consider to be the prevailing rate in the area because they're paying you no know, less than what's required on these projects. Um, and that's largely due to the influence of union rates in the area. A few, uh, few key things to remember, again, significant differences uh, between different regions. Um, you may have multiple wage determinations for one project, different work classes. Um, another point is once assigned, this does stay in effect for the duration of the project. So once you, you get a project under contract, um, the rates that are assigned will stay in the duration of the project. So here's an example of a wage determination sheet. Now these do vary state by state. The, the one that I have up here now just for kind of illustrative uh, purposes is one from California. And the reason I like to use the one for the state of California is that it, Visually, it breaks it down into the different categories of benefits from the fringe dollars. So it makes it a little bit easier to explain. In most states, you're just going to see a base hourly rate and a fringe rate and then the total. But if you look at this one for a for a journeyman, um, the bottom left here, the base hourly rate is 3201. They have 650 designated for pension or retirement, 686 per hour for health and welfare, vacation and holiday and training for a grand total of $50.48. So you've got roughly there $19 in, in fringe money that must be paid on this job. And again, in a lot of states, you're just simply going to see a base hourly rate of 3201, a fringe of roughly 19, and then a total of $50 and 48 cents. So this is kind of the breakdown of how they get to that total amount in the different categories that they use. So now we've kind of covered that. We're going to, you know, and we'll come back to this. We go over the benefits of, of offering fringe benefits in a benefits program versus paying them as cash wages to your employees. So again, the prevailing wage is made up of the two components we just showed on the wage determination sheet. You get the base wage and the fringe benefits. 
So those two components combined make up the entire um, wage that must be paid on those jobs. Then on top of that, when, when talking about the cost of paying your employees, you have your labor burden. And if any of you are involved in the bidding process, you, you probably know what this is for your company, um, but this is the cost of paying your employees their hourly rate. So if you're paying an employee $50 an hour, it costs the company more than $50 an hour to pay them that wage. Uh, it's probably gonna cost more like $65 an hour. And the reason for that is your labor burden, which comprises of your payroll taxes, which is your FICA tax at 7.65%, and then your federal and state unemployment taxes you know, add up to about 2% there usually. And then your workers' comp and general liability premiums that are based off of your payroll. So when you add these up, for most contractors, it ends up being about 30% is what their labor burden rate is. So for every dollar that you're paying your employees, it's costing the company 30 cents on the dollar in labor burden and these payroll taxes and insurance premiums that they have to pay in order to pay their employees, you know, their hourly wage. So kind of at the, the foundation of what we do and what we're gonna explain how you can do is taking those fringe dollars off of your payroll so that those fringe benefits, those fringe dollars are not subject to payroll taxes, your FICA tax, your federal and state unemployment tax, and they do not increase your workers' comp and general liability premiums. Taking those dollars off of your payroll eliminates you ever paying the labor burden on those dollars and generally saves contractors you know, tens of thousands of dollars annually in their labor cost. Now, if we're gonna use those, uh, those fringe dollars for benefits, you know, what options can you use? That's why I kind of went back to the California wage determination sheet since that breaks it out into the different categories. But basically you've got retirement, health and welfare, ancillary benefits. So health insurance, dental, vision, disability, et cetera. Um, apprenticeship plans and vacation and holiday pay can all come out of those fringe dollars uh, that you're required to pay your employees. And by doing that, you can remove them from your payroll and not have to pay that labor burden on those dollars. So, sounds easy enough. Just use those dollars for benefits versus paying as cash and, and you know, you get the savings. But there are a, a fair amount of rules and regulations that go into specifically how those benefits are structured and, you know, some rules that those dollars have to follow if they're going into benefits for your employees versus being paid as cash wages. So we pulled out a few little excerpts here from the Department of Labor uh, Prevailing and Wage Resource Book. You know, it's a pretty long document, uh, so we're not gonna bore you with the entire thing, but you can go online and find it if you'd like. Uh, but a few of the, the key points here is fringe benefits. Under the Davis-Bacon Act, the terms wages, scaled wages, wage rates, and prevailing wages include the base hourly rate of pay and any contribution made to a trustee or third party pursuant to a bona fide fringe benefit fund plan or program. <clears throat> So those are the requirements that these plans have to have to basically pass. They have to have a trustee or third party and they must be pursuant to a bona fide fringe benefit fund plan or program. And I'm gonna explain exactly what those different components are. Um, and the next key point is methods of pay. A contractor's prevailing wage obligation may be met by any combination of cash wages and creditable bona fide fringe benefits provided for a covered worker. So what that means is that that fringe portion of their pay can be made up by any combination of approved, creditable, bona fide fringe benefits and cash wages. How this is done is up to the employer. So it's up to you how you want to pay those fringe dollars. It's up to the employer how they want to pay those fringe dollars to the employees. And as long as the total amount is met, um, then you, you're compliant. You know, any combination of cash wages and approved benefits. So even in California, where it breaks out the four different categories, you know, I had 650 for retirement, $7 for health. You know, you don't have to follow that category by category. You just meet, need to meet the total amount. So an easy example is that, for instance, you have a health insurance plan for your employees and one of your employees has uh, coverage to their spouse. Uh, so they're not on your health insurance plan. You can take the money that would have gone to pay for that employee's health insurance and put it into the retirement plan for that employee. You're not required to pay that out as cash wages. You just meet, need to meet the total amount in any combination of approved benefits and cash wages. So we heard reference to a bona fide trust, and that is something that all prevailing wage benefits must be made into a bona fide trust. So the definition of that and the components that these plans have to follow 
is the fringe benefits must be made to a trustee and or third person irrevocably and must be pursuant to a fund plan or program. So what that stating is there must be a third party trustee on the benefits program and the benefits must be made irrevocably to that. What that's basically ensuring is that the employer cannot take the money back out once it's been made to the employee. Those benefits have to be for the employee that worked those hours and that employee needs to receive those benefits. So by putting them into a third party trustee uh, benefits program irrevocably, if the company has some unexpected expense that comes up, you know, they don't have access to that money. That, that money will stay with that employee regardless of what happens with their employment or status of the, of the company. Now that third person must not be affiliated with the contractor and subcontractor. So that's where you know, this trustee to the benefits plan must be a third party. You know, it can't be the, the company having their own. You know, one way that we oftentimes see this is on the vacation or sick time pay is that the company may take prevailing wage money, set it aside into a separate account with the company and then pay the employee when they take time off work. That's you know, not compliant by these standards of prevailing wage benefits. Those dollars must be paid to a third party trustee and must be made irrevocably to the plan. They can't be being held by the company. And finally, the trustee must assume the fiduciary responsibility opposed upon trustees by applicable law. Um, and again, that's something that, that we take on on all of our benefits programs um, so that you know, everyone's in compliance and we've got all these bases covered. That's kind of conceptually, you know, the, the basis of what we're looking to do with prevailing wage dollars on these projects. So we're going to get into kind of some of the numbers and what this can really mean for the company. So the first example we have is on a prevailing wage project if you're paying the fringe dollars on the paycheck. On this example here, you have a base wage of $40 an hour and a fringe benefit rate of $25 an hour. And I know we've got people all across the country on here. You know, if you're on the West Coast or in the Northeast, uh, you know, $25 fringe rate is very common and is probably average in those areas, depending on the trade. In other parts of the country, you know, the fringe benefit amount, you know, might be much less. It might be more like $10 an hour versus 25. Um, but this is just what we'll use for an example, um, but the concepts are all the same. So in this example, you have a total hourly amount of pay to the employee of $65 on their paycheck. Now we discussed the labor burden, which is generally 30%. Um, that's your payroll taxes, workers comp. So you're paying your employee $65 an hour, and then it's costing the company an additional 30% in labor burden cost, which is $19.50. It gives you a total hourly cost on this job of $84.50. That's your true labor cost on this project, $84.50 per hour. Now, conversely, if we take that money and we put the, the prevailing wage money into the into benefits, into a bona fide trust, we're just paying the employee their $40 base wage. That $40 base wage goes through payroll. So you pay the 30% labor burden on the $40 base wage, um, which is an additional $12. So $40 times 30% is $12 an hour, which is 52. Now you still have to pay the $25 fringe rate to the employees. They still have to get that money, but they're gonna get it into a benefits program instead of as cash wages on their paycheck. So we add that in after the labor burden is calculated and your true labor cost is now $77 an hour. So that's gonna reduce your labor cost by $7.50 per hour. Now, like I said, if there's anybody in here that's, that does the bidding on these projects, you know, being able to reduce your labor cost by $7.50 an hour when submitting bids, bids is gonna be very powerful for you to be able to win more of these projects to you know, increase your bottom line, increase profits, you know, gives you a, a lot of options of what you can do if you can reduce your labor cost by over $7 an hour on all of your prevailing wage projects. So we used a couple examples here that we see quite often. This is kind of the, the average company here that might be doing some prevailing wage work. It's $7.50 per hour per employee. And uh, that comes to see a lot of, you know, not everybody does prevailing wage work year round. It's often a mix of private and public. So if you're doing prevailing wage work half the year, so an employee half of their, their hours for the year, 1,040 hours, at that time, $7.50 an hour that you're saving, you can save $7,800 a year for each employee that does this type of work. If you've got 25 employees that do prevailing wage work, it's $195,000 that you can reduce from your labor cost on an annual basis simply by using the prevailing wage, the fringe dollars for benefits versus paying them as cash wages. 
so as you can see, it's a very significant amount. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that, that you can think of that your company could use that $195,000 for uh, to provide a better benefit to the company versus paying them in taxes and insurance premiums. And the next, you know, what does that allow you to do with your benefits programs is kind of what we're going to get into next. Um, but really, you're looking at all this prevailing wage money, all these fringe dollars, as kind of your budget to pay for benefits for employees. So again, using the same numbers, if you have a $25 fringe rate, um, an employee's working half of the year on a prevailing wage project, 1,040 hours, it's $26,000 a year that the company has at their discretion to pay for benefits for that employee. Now, you can't spread this out amongst other employees. They have to stay with the employee that worked those hours. But you have $26,000 basically at the company's disposal to pay for benefits for that employee. Again, with 25 field employees, that's going to be $650,000 a year that you have to pay for benefits. So there's really a, a lot of things that you can do with that to decrease the cost of benefits for the company, uh, offer improved benefits for your employees, um, different things with their health insurance. Uh, we can get into specifics with the retirement plan, um, but, but a lot of benefits for different ways that you use that money outside of just the labor savings. And again, using this as a strategy for growth, kind of like we were talking about at the beginning uh, of the presentation is that with the infrastructure bill, a lot of people coming into the industry, you know, they really see this as a way to grow their business. And this is a, a actually very common scenario that we see with a lot of our clients that come on board. And by doing this, they're able to win uh, a lot more prevailing wage projects than what they previously were. And by doing that, they were able to increase the size of their business and actually increase the amount of prevailing wage work they were doing over the course of time. But if you look at this starting at the bottom left in year one, if you've got 25 employees, you know, the numbers we ran, you know, you're saving about $195,000 in year one. But then in year two, you know, you're winning more jobs, you're staying busy, you're being more profitable, you're able to hire five more employees each subsequent year, that amount of savings just goes up. So over the course of five years, if a company, you know, added five employees year over year and just continue to do prevailing wage work half of the year, um, their savings on labor over five years would be $1.3 million. So again, the numbers add up very quickly and can really provide substantial um, savings and a competitive advantage to, to companies that have a program like this in place. Another uh, benefit for you know, using prevailing wage money for benefits versus paying cash is the impact that it can have on your labor cost when you're doing overtime. And this is one area, again, where some states, there's can be some di minor differences in the overtime laws and regulations. But in most cases, if you're paying the prevailing wage, the base and the fringe as cash wages, when an employee does overtime work, you have to pay one and a half times the full amount, the base plus the fringe. So on this, on this little chart here, the top option on cash fringe, you got a $40 base, 25 fringe. Take that times time and a half, the base rate becomes 60 and the fringe becomes 3750 for a total hourly rate that you need to pay your employees of 9750. Conversely, if you're putting that $25 of fringe into a benefits program, you do not need to pay time and a half on the fringe. You, you need to continue paying fringe dollars on all hours worked, straight time and overtime. You always have to pay those fringe dollars regardless of whether it's overtime or not. But if you're using those dollars for benefits, you do not need to pay it at time and a half. You can just pay that at straight time. So in that example, you've got fringe benefits of the Putting the dollars into fringe, into fringe benefits, you have a base wage of 40, fringe is 25, and time and a half of the base is 60, and the overtime um, for the fringe stays the same. So your hourly rate is 85 versus 97.50. So it'd save you, you know, $12.50 an hour on all of your overtime work as well, on top of all of the labor savings that we already discussed. So that was covering mostly how you can you know, reduce your labor cost on prevailing wage jobs by utilizing these fringe dollars, how they were really meant to be used and getting the tax and insurance savings. Uh, on top of that, there's some really large potential savings uh, and additional benefits to the companies, to the company and to the employees by how you're distributing those dollars into different benefits programs and how you can greatly reduce the cost of your benefits that you're offering your employees. 
So first one is using fringe dollars to pay the health insurance premiums. So again, these are these prevailing wage dollars that you're required to pay your employees. When you win the bid, when you win the job, whatever, you know, federal project, whatever, whoever you won the bid from, they're giving you this money to pay for benefits for the employees. So they're considered employer dollars that are required to be paid for benefits for the employee. So you can use this money to pay the employer's portion of your health insurance premiums. Now it should be used to cover the cost that the employer is required to pay. But at a minimum, the employer is required to pay 50% of the employee only coverage on a health plan for your employees. You can utilize these prevailing wage dollars as $25 an hour to cover the cost of the health insurance company health insurance plan that the company is offering. Additionally, we have a program that's called Our Banking, where we're able to take additional money from the prevailing wage projects when you're doing them and save them in an Our Bank for the employee to cover the cost of their health insurance premiums in future months when maybe you're not working, if there's seasonal layoffs, things like that, that you can spread this prevailing wage money out throughout the course of the year to cover the cost of health insurance premiums in future months, you know, avoiding any gaps in coverage throughout the course of the year. The next option is something that employees really appreciate a lot is funding an HRA program with fringe dollars. So again, that's a way that you can take some of this prevailing wage money off of your payroll, put it onto an HRA account for your employee. It allows them to pay for medical expenses tax free. And again, reduces your labor cost. You're not having to pay any of those payroll taxes or insurance premiums on those fringe dollars going to the HRA program. Then finally, making contributions to your 401k with fringe dollars gives you a lot of options in, in how your plan tests, you know, when you get to end of your plan testing on a 401k plan, offsetting uh, company match contributions, safe harbor contributions, and profit sharing um, can reduce the cost of your 401k plan by how we use the fringe dollars within the plan. Our banking, I'd kind of covered that, but again, kind of an example is over the course of a month, say that your employees earned $80,000 is what they had in prevailing wage money, but the premium for that month is only $20,000 for the health insurance for all of your field employees. You have $60,000 extra dollars there for that month that was not needed for their health insurance premiums. Now, maybe you know, later on in the year, you're not working, you don't have these prevailing wage dollars to cover their health insurance premiums in future months, we can take some of that extra money and put it in an hour bank for each individual employee. Again, it has to stay with the employee that worked those hours and save up to four months of premiums for that employee in an hour bank for them to cover their health insurance in future months. So great way to offer these employee benefits year round without interruption, depending on how your, how your work goes up or down throughout the course of the year. more information on the HRA program and that's funded with fringe dollars so it's prevailing wage money that's being put on an HRA card for your employee that's 100% tax free so the employees are able to then pay for all eligible medical expenses with tax free money um, so co-pays deductibles prescriptions etc um, so they don't need to come out of pocket for those leave yeah we have a couple examples here but in this HRA program you know anything uh, that's listed with the IRS publication for a qualified health expense can be used uh, or can be paid for with this HRA program. Here's what I was getting at. And the huge benefit to the employees, again, the fact that it's tax-free money that they have, you know, in their pocket that they can use to pay for these for these unexpected health expenses. So, example we use if you have a an employee has a one thousand dollar medical bill. If you don't have a HRA program, the employee's gonna have to pay that, you know, out of their or their own savings or checking account. And in order for that employee to have a thousand dollars in their in their hand to pay this bill, they had to earn, you know, roughly thirteen hundred dollars to have a thousand dollars in their pocket when you figure in the taxes that they have to pay, their FICA tax and their income taxes on that. So this is a way instead of an employee needs to earn thirteen hundred dollars to have a thousand in their hand to pay for that one thousand dollar dental bill. With the HRA program, it's 100% tax-free money. So every dollar that comes off of the fringe and goes to the HRA is a full dollar, and they have $1,000 to cover that that dental bill. They don't have to come out of their own savings, and you know they're using money that they don't have to pay taxes on. So something that employees really appreciate, 
And again, especially if you've got some seasonality, you know, maybe they're not working as much in the off season. You know, they have this card that they can continue to use for medical expenses when maybe their income isn't as high as other times of the year. And again, this is the HRA program. There's no maximum amount that they can have on their card. Um, and it rolls over year to year. And if they would happen to leave employment, they can take that with them and continue to use it to pay for medical expenses until the, the funds have been exhausted. So it's not a use it or lose it program. And again, you can put on as much as the company would like on this card for the employees. Um, most companies will pick a number that might be what your annual deductible is or your annual max out of pocket is just to ensure that the, that the employees cover that they have that much money saved uh, in the HRA to pay for any of these medical expenses as they come up. Otherwise, vacation, PTO, sick, and holiday benefits. Uh, these can also be paid for with fringe dollars. Um, one of the, the key things here, again, is that these programs need to be, needs to be a bona fide use of the fringe dollars, which means that they need to be paid to a third party trustee program where that money is held in, the, in an account for the employee. Um, this is one where we oftentimes see companies doing this themselves, taking some of the fringe dollars aside, saving their own comp in a company account for vacation pay. And while I'm sure that the intentions are always good and those dollars are always going to the employee, the way that the IRS sees it is that, um, you know, that money needs to be held in a third party trustee where the employees are guaranteed to get that money. So whether the employee leaves employment, if the business, you know, company went out of business for whatever reason, you know, there's always the risk that that employee doesn't get their money one way or another. Uh, so this ensures that they get their money and, and that your plan is in compliance so that you can use some prevailing wage money to pay your employees vacation time. Now, the one difference with this benefit versus the others is that when the employee takes time off work, when this is paid to them, it does get processed through payroll. So these dollars would end up being taxed uh, when they are actually paid to the employee. But the benefit again to the company is that you're using prevailing wage money instead of company dollars to pay your employees when they take time off work. A little bit on about 401k plans and kind of how they're different with a prevailing wage 401k plan. So kind of a few points here. The employee contribution limit is 20,500 of this year for a 401k plan. That's the most that an employee can put in on their own. The catch up provision is if you're over the age of 50, that is 6,500. So an additional 6,500 that employees can put in as a catch up provision. Those are the two components that most people recognize with 401k plans, but there's actually, and this is where the prevailing wage portion comes into play. The maximum amount when you combine employer and employee contributions is the lesser of 100% of compensation. They can't put in more than they make or $61,000 a year. So with the prevailing wage aspect combined into the 401k plan, the annual max for the employees is actually 61,000 and is also 61,000 for the owners of the company when you're figuring in uh, options for profit sharing, which is a, a great strategy for the owners of the business to be able to put more money aside for their own retirement. Um, loan provisions are allowed with 401k plans, including prevailing wage, um, and distributions, including earnings, are included in taxable income at retirement, unless it's a Roth designation. Um, we do also have hardship distributions available on these plans. So where does it become different when you add the prevailing wage component in? Is really the way we look at our retirement program is it's three retirement plans kind of melted into one. And where oftentimes with you know, other providers, if they don't have the experience or the technical capabilities with prevailing wage, they may recommend that a company uh, have two separate 401k plans, one for, one for prevailing wage, one for non-prevailing wage. And the issues there is you, end up in, it's more difficult for plan testing where the plan can be more easily out of compliance. So there's more compliance risk there, uh, higher risk for audit, and it's, it greatly increases the cost of the plan. So ideally, you'd like your prevailing wage component to be mixed in the same plan as your traditional 401k and profit sharing. So really we look at it as three plans built into one with three different buckets within the plan. So again, it's a retirement plan for all employees, so it's for your office staff, for owners, and prevailing wage employees. Employees can contribute on their own if they would like. We also have a bucket for prevailing wage dollars, so that's where all the prevailing wage money goes into the plan. Now, by doing it this way, you have increased participation in the plan. You know, 
the company is directing that these prevailing wage dollars go into the retirement plan, you have a lot more participation than what you would if it was strictly left up to the employees participating on their own. You also have higher contributions being made into the plan, meaning more dollars are going to go into the plan. And where that becomes important, and you'll probably be familiar with this if you have a 401k plan in place now, is that it gives you a lot more flexibility in safe harbor options. So oftentimes companies will offer a, what's called a safe harbor match on their 401k plan that will allow the owners to maximize their own retirement. The way that we test our plan, we can actually use these prevailing wage dollars to satisfy those tests, meaning that the safe harbor may not be required, or we can use those prevailing wage dollars to cover the dollars that were required for the safe harbor, meaning that the company does not need to put as much money in on their own they can actually use the prevailing wage dollars to reduce the cost of their safe harbor contributions. And again, it has the benefits of three plans with the administrative burden, fiduciary requirements, and cost of one plan. So, the more kind of how it reduces the cost is again, these prevailing wage dollars that are going to benefits are considered employer contributions. They're dollars related to the company, pay for benefits for your employees. So if your so every prevailing wage dollar that goes in is considered an employer contribution to the retirement plan, meaning that if you have a company match, a safe harbor match or a discretionary match, that any match that an employee had earned that year, if they received that money in prevailing wage month in prevailing wage dollars, that can count as their match. So we can offset the match that the company is required to pay with prevailing wage money. Now, that same thing is true for a company profit share. Say at the end of the year, the company is looking for a way to reward key employees um, with a profit share contribution or as a way to maximize their own retirement. We can include these prevailing wage dollars into the plan testing, and those dollars can again actually count as a profit share contribution for that employee. So when you're figuring out how much money is needed to be distributed amongst the company for the profit share, the prevailing wage money already in the plan can count towards those requirements. But it's a great way to reduce the cost of your 401k plan and increase the contrib contribution limits for um, maybe the non-prevailing wage employees and the owners of the business. Um, a little bit here in fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, this is another aspect that we could assist with. Um, and if you see these terms, I'm not gonna get into them real in depth, um, but there's three different levels of fiduciary responsibilities on a retirement plan. You have a 338 fiduciary, which is the investment manager. That's if you're hiring a 338 that chooses the investments on the plan. A 321 fiduciary would be someone that gives you investment, investment advice, but the company is still up to the company to actually choose the investments. And then on the plan level, the plan administration is called a 316 fiduciary. And that's who is responsible for um, basically the daily administration or operation of the plan from ensuring that eligible employees are enrolled in the plan or given the option to enroll, you know, that loans are being processed, all of those administrative functions. The big ones are employees being eligible to participate and are given the option to do so. And that's something that's generally taken on by the plan sponsor, by the company, but it's something that we can actually include in our, in our services if it's something that anyone was interested in including. And some kind of common questions that you know we always get is you know is somebody going to explain this to my employees you know what are their reactions going to be to taking more of their their fringe dollars and putting into benefits versus cash wages and yes this is a conversation we have with all of our clients and their participants um, so something we can discuss with them in an enrollment meeting a whole process um, but kind of one one chart that we like to show them shows the tax savings for the employee as well. You know, the company has significant savings, um, but the employees are also saving money on their taxes. So on the left-hand side, you can see $10 an hour going into the Beneco retirement plan. You know, those $10, you will never have to pay FICA taxes on them for the employee, um, and it grows tax-free until retirement. So $10 an hour comes off their fringe, and your $10 per hour goes into their 401k plan. Conversely, if that $10 an hour is paid out to the employee, they do have to pay their FICA taxes on that and their income taxes. So you're looking at you know, less than $7 an hour, the take-home pay versus having $10 in their retirement plan. 
just one example of some different things that we use for educational purposes for the employees and to explain the benefits to them. Um, another kind of topic, you know, why this is important and, and now as much as any is, you know, if you look at the statistics on how ready people are in the United States for retirement, it's, it's much lower than what we would like to see. Obviously, it's somewhat depressing to be honest, but the average American nearing retirement age uh, has, you know, if their company does not offer a 401k plan, the average savings they have is less than $5,000. If you do offer a, a 401k plan for your employees, it's over $100,000. So a significant difference there in how much the average person has for retirement if their company offers a 401k plan. Here's an example of you know, what it means you know, if you're doing prevailing wage work and putting in a larger amount into their retirement plan is kind of a case study of some of our clients and their participants. We have here on the left, we've got John Smith, age 31. He's worked for the company for nine years. And the only money put into the plan for him has been uh, prevailing wage contributions. And at the age of nine or 31, he already has almost $140,000 in his retirement plan strictly from prevailing wage money. So he's off to a great start for retirement. Another example, you've got uh, Richard Nelson, age 56, a little bit closer to retirement. You know, he's worked for a construction company for 16 years, uh, over half a million dollars saved for retirement. And the majority of that was from prevailing wage. So the employees can, can, can put more money in on their own if they would like, the company can offer a profit share or match. Um, and in this case, the majority was just prevailing wage and over a million dollars, or I'm sorry, over half a million dollars as at the age of 56. But much better situation to be in. And here's just another example at the looking at a company level, um, how much money goes into a 401k plan over the course of five years. And, and this is an example from one of our clients that you know started doing a smaller amount of prevailing wage work. It was 25% of their business. In the first year, they only put in you know, about $300,000 into their retirement plan at the company level. But then they kept continuing to do, have more employees and doing a higher percentage of prevailing wage work where you get over to year five and they've got over one and a half million dollars that's been put into their 401k plan and has saved them you know, almost 500,000 in, in labor cost. And then here's the savings for the employee. So again, for the at the employee level, um, that employee was putting in, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year in prevailing wage money. Over the course of five years, they have over sixty thousand dollars, without even counting for, you know, hopefully the market's going up over that time and increasing their savings as well. And the employee over those five years saved almost nineteen thousand dollars in taxes themselves. So savings all the way around, and just setting your employees up for for long term success. So that's kind of everything that I wanted to cover today. We've got some time here for Q&A. Kind of the main take homes is, you know, is a way to remove fringe dollars from payroll to save six to eight dollars um, in labor cost and all prevailing wage jobs. Um, using the fringe dollars to provide a medical debit card to pay for medical expenses and health insurance premiums. Um, and again, as a way to use the fringe dollars to maximize your retirement plan, um, improve how it works for your employees, the owners, and reduce the cost there as well. Had my old slide in there from the last presentation. So that's everything that I had uh, for today. I don't know if we've had any questions coming in yet, there, Robert. Uh, nothing yet showing up, but I know I have four. I'd love to ask you. What an absolutely fascinating presentation. So I learned quite a bit about Davis Bacon, and I've been writing about wages and benefits now for a couple of years. So that was tremendous. You guys offer a marvelous service. Uh, let's now open the webinar to questions. As Jason said, you can use the chat feature to submit a question, and I will read the question to the presenter, or if you prefer, unmute yourself, state your name and company, and ask the question directly. Remember to remute yourself after you finish. Jason, first question I'd like to ask you is, um, I have a member doing 25% prevailing wage work right now. How much do mm -hmm. they need to do for this to be worth it? I mean, really, that's plenty um, to be worth it. A any amount that you're doing, you know, the savings comes in on the first dollar. Um, so it's kind of up to the company to decide. But where we probably see this the most is that's how a lot of clients start off is doing 25% or maybe less prevailing wage work. And this is the strategy that they use to increase that number. So I would tell a company if they're doing 25% prevailing wage work, you know, that's enough to where you'll have substantial savings now. But the question is, do you want to do more? 
you know, and if it's like, I don't really want to do any more of this work, then maybe not so much. But if the answer is, yes, I would like to you know, win more of these jobs and do more of this work going forward, then absolutely it's, it's worth you to get started in it now. Next question is, what happens to my benefits when I'm not doing the prevailing, prevailing wage? Right. Yeah, that, that's always a good question because, you know, like, kind of like I said, most companies do not do exclusive prevailing wage work. So the nice thing about the 401k plan is it stays in place. There's no requirements from the company to put any money into it. You know, if you want to do a match or something, you can. Um, but the 401k plan basically can just sit there idly and be ready for your next prevailing wage project. Now, employees can always participate on their own, put money in. Um, but when you're not doing prevailing wage work, there's no requirements for funding the retirement plan. Um, health insurance is a little bit different. When you're doing, or when you offer health insurance, you are required to offer that for a full year. You set up a health insurance plan. You know, you can't stop the health insurance plan when you're when you're not doing prevailing wage work for a couple months. So that needs to continue to be paid. And that's kind of where it can come into play. Um, our hour banking can kind of help spread those dollars out throughout the course of the year um, to reduce the cost to the company. Got another question. Uh, do I have to use all of the fringes for benefits? No, you do not. Um, the more that you use or using all of them, we like to give the option of, of how to kind of get to a net zero on the fringe dollars just to maximize the savings to the company. But that's completely up, at, up to the company how they want to do that. If they want to pay half of it as cash and half of it into benefits. Uh, it's also something where a lot of companies might step into this over the course of a few years where year one, maybe. 50% of the fringe dollars go to benefits and in year two, 75% and year three, hundred percent, you know, instead of doing the full amount in year one. But the, the direct answer is. No, you do not need to use the full amount. It's up to the player, which they use. And another question, what if my employees choose not to participate? Excuse me. So going back again, this is an employer benefit that the employer determines. So it's really not up to the employee for the most part. Um, it's up to the employer to decide we're going to take X amount of this fringe money and put into a retirement program for you. Now, for instance, the employee does have the option to opt out if you offer health insurance and they maybe have coverage through their parent or through a spouse. Um, they can opt out of the health insurance plan, but then it's still up to the employer to decide you know, how that money that would have paid for their health insurance is paid to the employee. So the company can decide that that money goes into retirement. Um, they can still put money into the HRA for that employee, uh, vacation plan, other benefits, um, or choose to pay some of it out as cash. And are there any other questions? And I don't see anything showing up and no one on the phone is jumping in. And we're almost at the top of the hour too. I know people's time is important this afternoon. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. Jason, thank you very much for your time today to present this absolutely fascinating information to our guests. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, today's webinar was recorded and a copy of the recording will be provided to all registrants and attendees. Recording of this webinar will also be made available on the Nuka.com website and our YouTube channel over the next few days. And thank you for your time today to join us for Webinar Wednesday and for supporting Nuka. Our next Nuka Webinar Wednesday will be held next month in early May discussing our upcoming Washington Summit. We couldn't provide our depth of events and member services without the kind help of each of our supporting national partners, such as Benico. Thank you for your time this afternoon, and please enjoy the rest of the week.